Hello and welcome to Beamer Folk. This video is about several things. One is how electronics design can get itself involved in a physical application which is a little unusual. Secondly, it's about an issue that I've had within our property regarding black mould. And I suppose thirdly, it's about how you can have an adventure with electronics in a physical area that you would otherwise not think that it's applicable. I suppose you could add experimentation to that list. But let me start at the beginning. A number of years ago, we've got a room which is north facing and it suffered perennially with black mould occurring. Well, after a number of, you know, you can wash this clean with bleach or uh, specialised um, black mould cleaner and indeed it cleans off, but only to reoccur again the following year, mostly during the winter when the north facing walls, which of course didn't get sun on them, got cold and moisture condensed on the surface. A little bit of uh, physics here, which you're probably aware of or not, but it's only warm air that actually holds moisture. Cold air does not. And so therefore, if you have a, uh, which in this case, the black mould was being caused by air humidity within the property, it wasn't caused through a leak from the outside, which is a completely different issue. This was caused internally. So if you have during the daytime with minimal ventilation in your property, and incidentally, I am not a, um, an expert in black mould. Uh, I'm not a myceologist or anything like that, but I've learned through practical experience with property the um, consequences of black mould and how to kind of deal with it. But anyway, if you have, if you have moisture build up in your property and a wall within your property gets cold, the moisture in that warm air, as the walls cool down, will find its way to the coldest wall. In our case, that was the north wall, a room that was north facing that had the coldest walls, that was the wall. Those were the walls that got wet at night and um, facilitated for mould to grow. Of course, we dealt with this um, with regular washing that, but eventually we employed this device in front of you, which is a dehumidifier, and that works superbly. And I'm not going to go through all the various loops that we jumped through to solve this problem. But in principle, this little dehumidifier uh, solved the problem. And we operated it more or less 12 hours a day to get rid of the moisture. But eventually, over a couple of years, we found that it was only necessary if, um, uh, and incidentally, you can see an inset here of uh, a picture of um, black mould uh, accumulating on the on a wall surface next to a window and of course the window provides the coldness it's a cold area and that's where the moisture condenses so anyway this device was for us successful but I noticed over time because we were running it for this period of time every day one of the first things I noticed I didn't actually have to use it after all, you don't want for cost and convenience of keep empty in the container, etc. You don't want to run this unnecessarily. So uh, what I did was what I discovered is that you didn't need to run this during the summer. And that is probably from the end of April, middle of April through to the end of September, the beginning, middle of October. Uh, it's only during the winter months that you need to use this. Well, in fact, I refined that process to a point where I've, I discovered what days actually made a house um, warm with warm moisture to condense during the winter. And one of those 
uh, factors was the fact, fact of people running baths, anything to do with operating water. And of course, increasing ventilation is a good idea. You must have air flowing through a building to keep the air as, as dry as possible. But you don't in winter want the windows wide open. So uh, this little device, having a, a small amount of ventilation in your property, having this device running where appropriate is a good solution. But I didn't really want to uh, run this all the time. I only really wanted to discover when it was needed and then switch it on. Well, that led me to thinking about how I could, I couldn't directly electronically measure black mould where, you know, because you don't know where it's going to start, begin or whatever. So that would be rather clumsy. So what I thought of doing is creating a device which could, in a broad sense of the word, predict no more than, it's no more accurate than a predictor as to when mould would likely occur and occur in a way that electronics could predict because I wanted to find an electronic solution to this. The parameters by which I wanted the predictor to function on is one that, contrary to one's initial thought, I wanted it to fire an LED up when the temperature of the room got cold. You would kind of think the reverse of that is true. But all the while the walls are warm, in a warm room, condensation doesn't occur. It only occurs when the, wall, when the room starts cooling down and the walls particularly are colder than the moist air in the room. So my predictor had to had to take into consideration the temperature of the room getting colder and in a way kind of producing a product, a mathematical product of humidity as well, because there's no point in the predictor predicting firing up an LED if there's actually no moisture in the air. So I wanted really two sensors to work with. One was a humidity sensor and the other one was a um, temperature sensor. And that's what I pursued. As uh, serendipity would have it, I had a humidity meter and temp combined with a temperature meter, uh, the display went 40 on it and um, it was um, end of life. So that was considered by me as pennies from heaven. And I go to the next clip now and show you the innards to that device. So I just do that and there we are. So the display here was actually damaged. So this was effectively throwaway. But the two components that I like the look of, which I thought would help me greatly, was these two components here. One is a capacitive humidity sensor and the other one is a thermistor with a negative temperature coefficient. Very small device. And I go to the next clip here just to um, zoom in. And here we are. The thermistor here with the negative temperature coefficient means, for those that don't know, the resistance increases in the thermistor as the temperature goes down. So with these two components, it gave me a starting point to build a monitor to see if I can build a predictor that will be in accord with my feelings towards black mould and humidity. This needs to be qualified. This is only probably relevant to northern European climatic areas. There are places in the world, as we all know, where the humidity and temperature is so high that mould can grow within 20 minutes on any article of clothing. This predictor would not work there. This is really, and I live in the uh, southwest of England, and the temperate climate 
here is suited to my predictor here. This device wouldn't be global. Please don't be put off by a little bit of simple maths. This, I promise you, will give us a bit of an insight into how this device needs to function. Looking before us, we've got three very simple formulas. And the very top one we'll start with. At the end here, you have a reference voltage. And what we kind of want is an LED to come on if that voltage is exceeded. Now, what we need to do is if there's an increase in relative hum humidity, and this first formula is a product, you've got two variables here being multiplied with a product being produced here. And that number is simply produced by multiplying these two variables. So if, for example, the humidity increases, then this product here will increase, which will increase the voltage here. The voltage here is has been scaled from this number here. You can see the similarity, 1,400 to 1.4 volts DC. And it's scaled so that the voltage is within 0 to 5 volts. So this voltage cannot exceed 5 volts. So one of the conditions that we want is the LED to come on if the relative humidity goes up. Well, in this particular case, that is so. Because if that goes up, that will go up. And if that goes up, that goes up. And an LED will come on. When we come to ambient temperature, though, if the temperature decreases, which we want the LED to come on with, this uh, 20 degrees C will drop. And if that drops, then the product of these two will also drop. And this product here, 1.4 volts DC, will also drop. Well, that's not very good. Um, our device will not um, be satisfied with this first formula. So we've got to think of something else. Uh, mathematics is a way of seeing. It is to do with numbers, but it's also to do with vision. And it's a way of seeing how things relate to each other. The next formula here, which is ambient temperature divided by relative humidity, which moves over to here. So we have a quotient here on the numerator, which is this number here, which is degree C is now divided by the relative humidity, which is 70. And if you divide 20 degrees C by 70, or 20 by 70, you come out with a number like this. And when that is scaled up to within 5 volts DC, you end up with 2.86 volts DC. So that, in a sense, is our reference. OK, uh, if you increase the temperature, ambient temperature, the number here will also increase, which means that that will go up and the LED will trigger. Well, that's not very good. If the temperature here goes down, then this number here will go down and therefore this number here goes down. So that doesn't work. But if you, um, if you take going back to the 20 degrees C and divide it by 70, which is a relative humidity. If you increase that relative humidity, so therefore you want the LED to light, if you increase that number there, the number here will increase and the number here will increase and the LED will trigger. But the first position here with the 20 degrees C on the numerator line means that this formula dysfunctions because if 20 degrees C goes down, this will also go down and that will go down and the LED won't light. So that formula there is incorrect. 
So the other alternative is the final formula here. Very simple. And that is, as opposed to this, all I did was flip this over. So you've got relative humidity divided by ambient temperature. So relative humidity again is 70 divided by 20. If the humidity here goes up, then the number here will go up and the reference here goes up, which means the LED goes on, comes on, which is correct. Now, if you take 70 divided by 20 and decrease the temperature here of 20 to say 18 or 15, then this number will therefore increase and this number here, which is 3.5 volts DC, will also increase and the LED will come on. So for humidity going up, the LED will come on and ambient temperature for going down, the LED will come on. So this suits us ideally and it acts as an insight to how a device needs to operate. Effectively, this is a quotient uh, that we need to derive a formula based on a quotient. But actually, if you look at this and you flip it around a bit and go back to the original product formula at the top here, actually, all you need to do with this product, with a multiplier in between, is to create a reciprocal of that 20 degrees C. So it would be 70 multiplied by 1 over 20. And that would come to this number here. And it would function exactly the way we want it to, identical to this last formula here. So we've got two choices. Either we've got a multiplication that needs to go on with a reciprocal of the temperature, ambient temperature, or we can choose to have a uh, quotient formula where you've got relative humidity divided by ambient temperature. I hope that's understandable. And of course, these, this formula needs in some way to be scaled so that you end up with a voltage. Doesn't matter what voltage really, but a voltage that sits somewhere between naught and 5 volts DC. And I, I hope it's given you some insight as to how this is going to um, uh, translate into uh, hardware. Here we are at my favourite simulator, online simulator, Fausted simulator. I've got in my head the exploration we did mathematically, so I need to take the points we learn into consideration in this simulation. We go from left to right and uh, I've implemented my idea in uh, CMOS 555 timers and uh, an op amp which is a comparator on the end there driving an LED. First of all we have this, well the first 555 as it's stated at the bottom, it's an A-stable oscillator, a relaxation oscillator, and it's set at a frequency which is 344 hertz. That's more or less defined by the values of these three components here, the 47 nanofarad, the 1K, and I've got 67K there. That actually in the prototype is 82K, but it's been adjusted to get my simulation at the same frequency as my prototype. That defines the frequency uh, on its output, triggers the next 555, configured to be a one-shot monostable. Its timing components are this resistor here, and this capacitor here. Well, this capacitor actually is the humidity sensor. And as humidity goes up, so does the capacitance. And as the atmosphere dries, the capacitance goes down. 
in value. Moving on, uh, we've got here a filter network. This little, uh, and each element is filter network. It's a low pass filter. Each element here, which is the R there and the C there, produces a, a 6 dB per octave drop. And as I've got two of them, the overall effect of this low pass filter is uh, to have a 12 dB per octave roll off. And that feeds into, as I said earlier, the op-ent comparator. I only use half of a dual um, op-ent package simply because I don't have a CMOS single uh, package. And I'm pretty sure that um, if one went out and looked for it, you would find a single CMOS package out there, which would be ideal for this application. The other side of the comparator, and incidentally, that um, filter network feeds into the non-inverting input to the op-amp. The inverting input goes through to a potentiometer, which is a 10K potentiometer, and uh, which is level shifted by this 3.3K resistor. And finally, we have a look at this in this network, and that is the thermistor, the negative temperature coefficient thermistor. And I'll go through the interaction between these two sensors, the thermistor and the um, uh, humidity sensor in a second. The output of the comparator simply drives a resistor and into an LED and uh, down into a negative rail. The power supply is fixed at a constant 5 volts. So an inverter, if you, which I do, need to run this on three triple A's or three double A's. I've actually got it set up as a double A rechargeable battery pack. And I've got a little one of those little inverters which convert that to five volts constant. There is a, an important reason why that converter package is there. It does maintain a stable five volts irrespective of what the battery pack is doing. And that's there to maintain the timing issues with these two 555s. And although 555s are pretty accurate in their timing. It wasn't accurate enough for this circuit. This circuit is actually quite critical. You could improve upon the oscillator by having a quartz oscillator and a divider network. But one of the considerations I had in mind for the whole of this circuit is to keep power consumption down to a minimum. What I'll do now is just demonstrate the traces below, these three traces here. The first trace, which comes off the point between the output of the first 5.5 five, and the trigger input, which has a negation above that, that line above, is in the middle here. And as you can see, this is a very short pulse. The reason being is that the second 5.5 five, 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 is triggered on the negative going pulse and you kind of make that as short as possible. Originally I had a capacitor differentiating the signal with a resistor up to the supply but I found that if I made the first oscillator in such a way that it produced a very short pulse which is here negative going pulse this second 555 is quite happy with that. The Next uh, waveform is a pulse width modulation, which is effectively what this uh, monostable produces on its output, which is here. And as you can see, the signal here is a typical pulse width modulation trace, and its duty cycle is at 37%. When that is passed through the low pass filter network here, it comes to a point here, and that point there is this trace here. And as you can see, there's just the finest of ripples on that DC at this frequency of 344 hertz. And it's producing a voltage at that point there. 
of 1.931 volts DC. Now, I mentioned earlier on that I had a second wasted op amp, CMOS op amp, and that's true. Originally, I used that second op amp to derive an oscillator in this position here. There are a number of configurations you can use to generate oscillators, but I found them all to be inferior, and the best one for this circuit here was the triple five. Well, let's now go into the dynamics of this circuit and see how it functions. We can see that the LED here is not lit. If I adjust this potentiometer here, you'll see it fire up. So if I move the potentiometer to the right, there it is. It's just fired up there. And what I've done by moving it right is I've moved this potentiometer the wiper effectively down towards the voltage at this point here. To make the LED typical comparator light up, that voltage there needs to be lower than this voltage here. Well, this voltage here is at 1.93. So the potentiometer had to make this slightly lower than 1.93 which is what has just occurred. Now, if I adjust it back again, so that it's just off, you can see it actually as an in-between um, function. It's actually flashing very slightly. That's got something to do with the slight ripple on the output of the uh, uh, low-pass filter. So if I just get it to a point where it is just off, Supposing now the humidity in the room increases, the effect of that would be to increase the capacitance value here. And I can do that with this simulator by just rotating the middle wheel of my Roden down a bit. I've gone to 56 nano. OK. And it takes a little time for it to translate to the comparator, but you can see what's happened. The LED is now lit. Now, supposing in the room, the room temperature actually lifted. We're moving away from a cold temperature through to a warmer temperature. So now I move my middle wheel to the thermistor and because the room temperature has increased, the resistance will go down. So again, I'll just tweak that. We were at 7.3 K ohms, which is at 18 degrees C. So let's say the temperature now went up to 20 degrees C or 25 degrees C. That would be warm, wouldn't it? So if I increase, if I reduce the resistance of this, gone to 6.8 K, 5.6, And you can see what's the effect of that is to make the LED start to turn off. And it's now fully turned off at 3.9K. So you can see how there is an interaction between these two sensors. If the, if the capacitance value increases on the capacitive sensor, that indicates humidity has increased. But if the temperature of the room is high, for example, in the summer or a warm day, the thermistor will drop its resistance and counter the effect of the uh, capacitance sensor. And I'll just revert them back to let's say 6K8, and bring this one back to 47. So 47 nanofarad um, is at a relative humidity of 70%. I'm not sure how accurate that is. It probably is 33 nanofarad, 
somewhere around there because I didn't specify the components. I don't have data sheets for them. So I've just um, uh, learnt this empirically by experimentation. So what have we got? Uh, I couldn't get back to the 7.5 or can I? Let's just go into here and actually do it on the editor. Let's put in 7.5 again, which is the um, resistance value at 18 degrees C. And we can see that the LED is off. Now, if I move it to the right, it comes on. So let's say uh, you've set the potentiometer so that at these two values of these two sensors, the LED is now lit. Supposing that the atmosphere of the room starts to dry out, then this capacitance value will go down. So let's see the effect of that. So it's at 47 nanofarad at the moment. We've gone to 39 and it takes the time for that to translate. And there you are, the LED has gone out. So the humidity in the room has gone down and the LED has um, gone out. Bring that back to 47. Uh, allow for a moment or two and it should come back on. Mm -hmm. There we go. It takes the time. The reason why it takes the time is that this um, uh, second order low pass filter arrangement here has got a time constant uh, attached to it. And it takes time for uh, changes in the pulse width modulation to arrive at the comparator's non-inverting input. So let's now um, go to here. So we've got uh, 47 nanofarad which is at relative humidity of 70%. Now, supposing that the... Um, let's, let's turn that off. Let's turn the LED off. About there. Now, given that the humidity is producing um, in the room is 70%, but the room temperature started to drop, which is what we said is where the moisture condenses on the walls is when the uh, temperature of the room drops. Now, if the temperature of the room drops, this thermistor's resistance will go up. The LED at the moment is off. So if I increase the resistance here, bang, we've gone from 7.5 to 8.2K. So all I've got to do now is get to the prototype on the breadboard and see how this functions in the real world. As this video seems to be getting a tad too long, I thought I'd leave the demonstration of the hardware prototype to part two. But before I go, I'll just breathe onto the humidity sensor and get the LED to activate. And there she blows. Now let's see if I can counter that by heating up the thermistor, which is right over here. And there you go. This is Beamer signing out for now.